mostly bullish coverage overall of the ride hailing platform. You can see right there on the screen. City and outlier yeah. with its neutral yeah. call. Oh, I just said, I think I said but bullish. City's analyst Mark May is still with us, as I just mentioned. We're also going to bring in Cowan analyst John Blackledge. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you. Thanks, Mark, we'll start with you. Thank yeah. you. Why neutral? I love the fact that I'm the outlier on that chart. Yeah. I, it, it, I, I really I had no Do idea. You really? what, I had no idea what the ratings were going to be, and I, I'm surprised because obviously the the market reception to Uber and Lyft has not been great. I would have figured at least one other analyst would have come out on the on the side of most investors here. But uh, look, the the big picture is uh, we are very bullish on this category. Um, you know, in a very short period of time, we're talking 65 billion in bookings globally for the ride-sharing sector, and we think that the, this business, uh, this industry, is well over 300 billion, and that's our that's our base case, or even our our, our, uh, our bear case, really. So we're very bullish. I, I think the issue is what's baked into the stock. What are expectations for the next year, which is accelerating revenue growth in the face of rising competition, not just in the U.S., but in Brazil and other countries? Uh, there are a lot of big country opportunities out there, Japan, Germany, where the regulators and the local authorities and even the citizens haven't been very receptive to these businesses. There's a lot that needs to be sorted out here. And I, I still am not sure that, it, that those risks are fully reflected in the stock right now. So that's I, I think that this Uber in particular has a lot to, to prove before they can uh, command a, a, a premium. John, how are you thinking about the risk reward here where Uber is concerned, especially given the fact that you have initiated coverage with an outperform rating and a $58 price target? Yeah, I mean, we think uh, it's well positioned. We think the rides and eats business is well positioned to grow um, near term and long term, driven by positive secular trends. Um, one point of differentiation in, in our launch piece was the use of our proprietary uh, survey data in the U.S. that We've been tracking ride sharing and food delivery for several years now. And on the ride side, uh, we've noticed um, uh, ramping uh, user penetration across all ages, but really pronounced and fast paced growth from younger demos and also uh, higher uh, trip frequency. Those are the two uh, fundamental drivers of the rides business. So it gave us confidence in our forecast. And then on the eat side in the U.S., we saw the user penetration triple uh, since 2017. They have more monthly users than Grub now, and the business also skews younger, which bodes well longer term. So we think these trends extend internationally that we're seeing in the U.S., and that's part of the reason why we came out with the outperforming $58 price target. Mark, I wonder what you make of some claims, and I'm quoting from a bunch of different sources that have initiations today. One is that they can get EBITDA positive by 2022. Uh, the other is that the core writing app is closer to net profitability than maybe we thought going into the IPO. Yeah. Are either of those things false? Uh, I think that the EBITDA break even in 2022 is a little aggressive. You know, that, that, that looks like a 2023, 2024, you know, maybe we're splitting hairs sure. here, but that seems a little, a little early. Um, the company is talking about EBITDA losses being elevated uh, certainly through 2020 and still in loss mode in 2021. We're well over a billion dollars in EBITDA losses in 2021. Assuming uh, break even or profitability in 2022 seems a little early for us, especially the company is aggressively investing in uh, eats, freight, uh, e-bikes, autonomous vehicles. These are all initiatives that are only one to three years old, very early initiatives that collectively are, are causing all these losses, which feeds into your next point, which is, we, we do, I do agree, with, though, with the second point, which is the rides business, the economics of the rides business probably is more favorable than people uh, thought early on. Uh, it's hard to tell that because they don't break out profitability by segment, but really the losses are being driven by eats, freight, autonomous and these other factors. So, you know, while I might not have a buy on the stock, I very much believe in the unit economics of the core rideshare business, both for Uber and Lyft and most of the other players that are in the market. John, last earnings for, or I guess really first public earnings for Uber last week. Um, one of the things that was an area of softness was the Latin American market, which has been so key to this company. How are you assessing that? Yeah, I mean, that was a DD went in. Uh, Sao Paulo is one of their top five markets for rides. DD went in and, and uh, was aggressive on pricing. And I think the company told us, um, you know, that that 
it got a little more rational. So I think that will be fine. Um, and on the point, we, we did a lot of work on the unit economics. And um, uh, we're saying that the rides business generates 45 cents profit per trip on average this year. And it grows modestly uh, over time. So this narrative that the rides business is a loss maker is wrong. And I agree with Mark that it's on the on the eat side. Um, when we did this analysis, we're, we think they're losing about three dollars. Uh, per trip this year. The losses will decline over time, but they are being aggressive in, in expanding in geos and getting trying to get more market share, et cetera. But um, but rides is uh, that that notion that it's a loss maker is is wrong based on our work.